act of praise, letting students know they're getting it right. I am part of the main PBIS uh, collaborative. We have a group between University of Maine Farmington and University of Maine Orono and University of Southern Maine where I'm at. And we have been working together for probably about 10 years together. We've been working with the state for the last three or four years um, on uh, supporting schools, implementing positive behavior interventions and supports. So we've been doing a lot of good work around the state around this. I also am the coordinator of the main PBIS um, conference, state conference. We have our 11th conference this November. We will be holding the conference, but it will be a um, virtual conference. We're going to be holding it online like this, where we're going to have different um, breakout rooms for people to go to. So we will be holding our conference, but it won't be at the Augusta Civic Center. So we're uh, just doing something a little bit different this year, given all of the new things that we are adjusting to in our current situation. So that's a little bit about Maine PBIS. And I'm at the University of Southern Maine. I'm in the special education department. I do teacher education. I support um, people who want to get their teaching certificate in special education. Our program is fully online, so we have people, I actually have had people in North Carolina, believe it or not, getting their main teaching certificate. I have people in New Hampshire and Maine, in Massachusetts getting their main teaching certificate, and then they transferred over to their own states. So um, we have a pretty good um, reach of people who are uh, getting their initial certification through us. So that is a little bit about me. And I would love to learn something about all of you, but I don't think I can hear from all 150 of you before it's time for us to be done today. So I, would, um, I, I do have your names though, and I appreciate the fact that you're all here today. So let's see, this is not gonna let me go forward. Hmm, all right, I'll have to use my... All right, so by the end of this session, I hope that you will have a general understanding of the effect of praise on intrinsic and intrinsic motivation. That's always a big piece for people when they think about praise and rewards is this is going to cause people to not be intrinsically motivated anymore, that they're only going to have extrinsic motivation. So I'm just going to spend just a few minutes talking about that because that's always something that people are concerned about. Um, I hope you have a bit of an understanding of the ways that we should and shouldn't be offering praise and know what the components are of an effective praise statement. Uh, what are some of the factors that we wanna consider when we deliver the praise? So not only what are the parts of the praise statement, but how should we deliver it? And then at the end, to be able to construct a specific descriptive effective praise statement. And I like to um, add outcomes to that so that students know what do they get um, when they're, you know, what's the outcome of engaging in this desirable behavior? So if we can give that praise in such a way that they understand there's an outcome, it makes it even more powerful. So that's what I hope that you uh, will get from this session. So I have at the very end a slide with resources that has links to everything that I have put into this presentation. So you don't have to worry too much about um, these, but I do try to put on every slide and every section where I got the information from so that you can go back and dig deeper into the information. There's a lot of research and a lot of information out there about effective praise. So it's really hard to focus on certain things, but I try to pick things that are accessible and that have good research behind them that you can access yourself once this is over. One thing is, is that on the um, um, PBIS apps, which is a place that we go to to support our students around progress monitoring and uh, data management uh, for PBIS, um, they put out a newsletter called Teach by Design. And then there's one newsletter that's called Five Ways to Reward Students the Right Way. So I took some slides from there, but I really, I have a link for it at the very end. And I encourage you to go back and read this um, article because it's really short. They also have really fun and funny um, video um, or GIFs that uh, represent some of the points that they're making, which make it all the more fun to read. But to start off with talking about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Um, in 1971, Edward Decky and in 94, Judy Cameron both studied the effect of rewards on intrinsic motivation. Because again, there's a lot of concern that if we provide feedback 
um, in terms of praise or rewards, that students are going to become less intrinsically motivated. So um, they both came up with very, very different conclusions about this. So Decky came up with the conclusion that it's, it, it very much deteriorates intrinsic motivation, and Cameron came up with the opposite, which is it depends on how you deliver it that makes the difference about how, how the motivation is affected. So somewhere in the middle, as we all know, right, in the world that we're living now, depends on that the two different extremes, that somewhere in the middle is probably the truth of it. So we want to be um, aware of how we're delivering that praise is probably um, the, the uh, stronger indicator of whether we are eroding at somebody's intrinsic motivation. So I wanted to just ask you a couple of these questions to see, um, you know, your thoughts about this. So when was the last time someone praised you or gave you a reward for sounding out words or reading? Because I'm pretty sure that when you first started reading, people were doing a lot of encouragement. They were giving you positive praise. They may even given you external stickers or, you know, candies or tokens or trinkets. Um, if you were somebody that really needed a lot of motivation to read. For some people, reading doesn't come easy. So we have to provide them more. But for pretty much everybody, when we first started reading, somebody was there giving us some positive praise. They were telling us we were doing a good job. But when was the last time somebody, time somebody gave you positive praise when you were reading? It's probably been a while, right? So somewhere along the line, right, you stopped needing that external praise because you became intrinsically rewarded by the by the mere act of reading. It became rewarding in and of itself. And that's one of the important things to remember about praise, is that we want it to boost somebody up while they are learning or acquiring or achieving something that's difficult for them to the point where then that thing in and of itself becomes the reward. So I ask in the same question, when was the last somebody praised you or gave you a reward for using the toilet? Pretty much when we went through toilet training, there was claps. There was cheers, there was call to grandparents, guess who just went duty on the toilet, right? We had those things happening. But probably nobody's really cheered you on when you came out of the bathroom. Maybe when you came out and washed your hands, because now we're really into hand washing. So maybe there's lots of cheering going on for hand washing right now. But we've, those things get faded away and we are just intrinsically motivated, right? By the mere fact that it's pretty rewarding to use the toilet rather than having an accident. So, you know, as we become more rewarded by the mere act of the behavior, we don't need those external rewards anymore. So this is kind of the key thing to think about with intrinsic and extrinsic is, you know, what are we delivering? How are we delivering it? And how long are we delivering it for that um, cause that, that behavior to become dependent on that reward? Um, and then thinking about the students who are always in a state of deprivation. So people ask me a lot, this student asks me, can I have a sticker for this? Or, uh, you know, when somebody does something, I did that too. And one of the things that we want to think about is that some students need more than other students. We already know this, right? Some students need more help reading than other students do. Some students need more help tying their shoes than other students do. So there are some students who are in more need of acknowledgement of their uh, abilities than other students are. And they may always be in a state of deprivation in terms of what they need to know that they're doing a good job. And I sometimes use the analogy of if you've got a car and it's got four tires and one is low on air, the tire you're going to put more air in is the one that's got low. So sometimes kids are a little bit low on air and that we need to add a little bit of air to them. They're in a state of deprivation. So let's just boost them up a little bit. Again, the trick is how are we delivering it? What are we delivering it? Delivering, what are we delivering and for how long? So that we can make sure that we're not making them overly dependent upon it, that they're learning that. So um, one of the things that I'm doing right now is I'm raising a puppy and I'm using a lot of praise. I'm also using a lot of food treats because um, it's really hard for dogs to understand what praise means unless we pair it with something that they understand, which is food treats. And we have to keep this in mind with kids. 
um, or sometimes even adults, is, is what we're um, rewarding them with something that they're interested in? Um, and can we then again fade those things away? So these are just some things to think about in terms of intrinsic and extrinsic. It is not necessarily the reward itself, it's how we are using the reward or the praise, um, how we're delivering it and um, for how long and um, you know what it is. So this is what the rest of this presentation is sort of about, is about um, seeing if we're doing this the right way. Let's see, there it goes. So um, one of the things that, um, um, a, a good analogy for this is to think about this. If you're reading a book and then someone comes up to you and you're a person who really likes to read and they say, I'll give you a dollar for every 10 minutes you keep reading. What would you do? Would you take a dollar for every 10 minutes to keep doing something that you really like to do? I know that I probably would, right? That's not hard to do. Sure, I'll take a dollar for every 10 minutes to read because I like to read. Um, at some point, that person says they're going to stop giving you a dollar. What would you do? You might stop reading, right? Because you've been reading for quite some time now, and you like to read, but you don't need the dollar for reading. So you might stop reading because you're sort of over it, and you don't need that motivation because you read anyway, so you stop. But if you're not great at reading and somebody wants to teach you how to read and they tell you they're going to give you a dollar for every 10 minutes, you stick it out with reading. Um, and then that, that um, dollar that you're getting starts to be replaced with the, um, uh, your ability to be able to read and you start to become more motivated because you're able to read and you start getting the pleasure out of reading. And then they say, I want to stop paying you to read then you also might say, I don't need to be paid to read anymore because I'm getting the pleasure of reading. So that's, you know, it's the same kind of a thing is that sometimes we don't need to be rewarded if we don't, if we, or we will, um, we will um, easily leave a reward if we don't need it. Also, we may be able to outgrow a reward if we become intrinsically motivated by something. So you can um, think about, again, this process sometimes that we go through to get to the point where we become genuinely rewarded by the act itself rather than um, being rewarded by the external reward. Another analogy that I give to my students is I talk to them about providing um, donations to charities. And charities often send you a thank you note. Would you keep giving to the charity if they stopped giving you a thank you note? Probably because it's not based on the thank you note, right? It's based because you want to give to that charity. You're not sitting at your mailbox waiting for that charity to send you a thank you note. But it's not, it's not bad to get a thank you note, right? So those are the kinds of things to think about in terms of intrinsic and extrinsic. But this will always come up, and this is always a struggle that people have and a concern that they have about that. So I would say let's think about how we deliver it and what we deliver. Um, all right, so I'm going to skip this because you're going to be able to get this, but this is, this is kind of what... Decky and Cameron's um, study was about. Decky really looked at people getting rewards for something that they were already good at and had mastery at. Um, and so they stopped wanting the reward. So that's how he saw it, rewards being detrimental. And Cameron looked at um, rewards being for people who were needing motivation and realized that really what we needed to do is think about how we were delivering those rewards um, so that, that the, it would be more effective. So that's in the end. So I'm going to move along here. So what are some of the ways that we shouldn't and shouldn't be offering rewards? So this is from this Teach by Design article. So they talk about things like don't bribe, but do celebrate achievements. So it is really important to think about how we deliver. Again, this is the part about how we deliver this. So we want to use rewards to motivate students to do what they, we want them to do. And we want them to increase behaviors that are desirable and appropriate. But we don't want to say things like, I'll give you this ticket if you do this. We want to be able to say um, when you are able to do this or when this happens, not if. Like the if is like a quid pro quo, right? It's like, if you do this, I'll do that. This is when you're able to do this, then, we'll do, then the acknowledgement will come. Or not even making it contingent. By sometimes we simply um, see the behavior occurring and provide the feedback. 
the feedback. So celebrating the achievements instead of um, saying, I want you to do this and I'm only going to give you the reward if you do that. So it sounds like it's semantics and it really is, but we want to think about how is that being worded and we're going to get into more about the wording a little bit later. Um, don't make it about getting the thing, let the token be your reminder. So um, I can tell you that from training my puppy, it's all about the, the food rewards. She is very attentive when she thinks she's getting a treat. And I'm, I'm often telling my husband, you have to put the praise before the, the food because otherwise she'll only do things if food is present. So in this case, it's about don't put the food before the um, verbal because I want her to be more rewarded by verbal than the food. So if we make the token the reason why they're doing the behavior, they're, gonna, they're only going to do it for the token. What we want to be able to do is let the token be a way for us to remind ourselves to engage with students in a positive way. So we're having these tokens or these, um, you know, if you use um, other reminders, like some people use their watch to remind them, different ways to let these systems be a way to remind us to engage with students in a positive way. So instead of having the token be the, the uh, reason why students behave, having the token be the way that we remember to interact with students in a positive way. So many of you have probably heard of four to one or five to one gets the job done. That's four positives to every one correction. So we want to try to um, strive for that. And the best way to do that is to, you know, give ourselves reminders and help us get through to that point. And Tracy, I can't see the chat box at all. So hopefully you're keeping track of that. <laughs> um, this is more about if you're using this for a whole class, but don't turn a group reward into an individual punishment. So sometimes we have group rewards and then one student will do something and we'll punish the whole class for that one student's behavior. So we, we definitely don't want to do things like that. that. That erodes the community of the classroom. It also erodes what that one student may have had for any amount of self-esteem or um, any pride that they may have had. So we want to keep individual consequences as individual and keep the group consequences as a group. Um, so keeping those group rewards more around um, the community working together to earn something together and keeping the individual consequences separate from that. The one thing we don't want is one kid being seen as a scapegoat um, and having, um, you know, setting up those scenarios. That's just not a good way to deliver any kind of feedback. And then don't be a one trick pony, um, but mixing it up. So tangible external rewards can work really well, but they're not the only way to provide acknowledgements. You want to think about all the different ways that you can engage positively with your students. So in the article, and also I created a, a hot link here. So if when you go back to look at this presentation, you want to just use this, you can click on that. And there's a matrix that you can use that you can look at all the different ways and places and contexts that you can engage in positive interactions with your students and the different ways that you can do that. So you can use verbal, you can use proximity, you can use um, uh, tokens, you can use, um, you know, physical things like high fives and fist bumps. So it's a way to sort of say, what is the whole variety of different things that I'm doing? It doesn't just have to be tokens and it shouldn't just be tokens because again, that can create an over-reliance on things. And we want to really create a more naturalistic environment for engaging in positive interactions. Personally, I want my acknowledgement system or my reward system or the system that I'm setting up to be more relationship based because that's what's going to sustain behavior over time is building relationships and having students recognize that um, working together, collaborating together, um, doing things because it's for the better good of the group or for the relationship and working together, that's the way that people are going to be, be able to sustain this over the long term, as opposed to if I do this, then I get to get into the prize box. Now, I'm not saying that that's, that's not good because some students need that, but you don't want that to be the only thing you're doing because that will be become the, fit, the focus of the, of the um, way to praise students and to acknowledge them. So we want to just sort of mix it up a little bit and look at all the different ways that we can acknowledge students. 
So that matrix is a, it's, it's a, a matrix that's got some ideas in it already and a way for you to be able to think about how are all the different ways that I can um, engage with my students in a positive way. And then the last one is don't make students guess what they did, use your words. So a lot of times you hear things like good job or, um, you know, um, you know, you were awesome. If we, if we don't attach specific language to those, we will um, not allow the student to know exactly what they were doing so they can do it again. The whole point of verbal praise is so the students will do it again, right? We want them to do that thing again. So if we don't give them specific descriptive feedback, they may not have any idea what they're doing that we're, that we want them to do again. So we want to be able to create praise statements that allow the student to know exactly what they did so that if there's a relationship there and they want to engage in that again, they will know what to do. So having the relation, uh, the um, information to be able to say, ah, I just walked in the hallway, I'm gonna do that again. Or ah, I put the heading on my paper, I'm gonna do that again. Or ah, I just helped a friend, I'm gonna do that again. We can, we can start to build up a repertoire for students because they'll be seeing what their behavior exactly was and what to do again. So this is a, you know, looking at how we can um, deliver. What are some things that we can use to help um, deliver the information? Um, thinking about um, some do's and some don'ts. So when we look at some of the components of effective praise, we want to look at um, what, what are some of the pieces that we want to put into these praise statements. So one thing is to make them positive and non-judgmental. And I know that you know, nobody ever really intends their positive statements to be anything but positive, but um, sometimes we, we kind of are coming from a place that where we either grew up or we experienced and we don't realize um, what, the, what the message might be sending. So I'm just gonna go through some of these positive and non-judgmental. So you wanna say things like, thanks for raising your hand and waiting to be called on, as opposed to thanks for finally following our rules and not shouting out. So, and I know that that may sound, sound like who would say that, but sometimes, sometimes these things get said, right? Um, because this could be a situation with a student who this, like they are having a hard time following the rules and they did finally follow the rules, but we don't want to, make that explicit. What we want to do is celebrate that they raised their hand because that is more explicit and if we say that you raised your hand and waited to be called on that's a behavior that they can do again as opposed to finally following the rules and not shouting out. Not shouting out is a non-behavior that doesn't tell them what they did do and finally following our classroom rules sounds a little judgy right? So say thanks for raising your hand and waiting to be called on. Being sincere Again, this one seems obvious. Um, awesome taking turns during recess today. It looked like you were having a great time with your friends as opposed to you're the nicest. So pretty vague, not very specific. Um, and it's, you know, without coming up with these specific indicators, it might not seem like you're really being sincere about that they really did have a great recess during the day. And then immediate with proximity. So this one can be different based on the context because sometimes we're not going to go and whisper at a student's, you know, that close to a student. Um, so it's not always about the whispering, but it might be about getting close to a student. Um, so thanks for using an inside voice, keeping up the good work. Now in this case, because they're praising the student for using an inside voice, it might be really good to get close to them and do that as opposed to calling across the room. That might be kind of contra-intradictory, contra, you know, I'm trying to say, Contra, I can't say it. You know what I'm trying to say though, right? <laughs> um, it would not make sense to yell it across the room if you were just rewarding them for having an inside voice. Um, but with the immediacy too, is rewarding them for something that they did last week with you. And I can give you a, another example. Um, I was working with the staff, with the student on the, and the student was doing something on the playground and somebody noticed this student from inside doing something on the playground. So when he came inside, they praised him and said, you did a great job helping so-and-so on the swing. And he said, that wasn't me. 
And I said, yeah, I just saw you on the swing do that. And it goes, uh-uh, that wasn't me. And just that amount of time from getting from the swing and into the building, he completely forgot that whole incident and utterly denied that he had anything to do with this whole positive event. It was a great thing. But the lack of that immediacy for him caused him to not even remember that there was this um, event that he engaged in. So that, that kind of immediacy can really make a difference for some students, catching them right away and giving them that feedback. Um, so now getting into specifics. So those all had also the um, feature of being specific and descriptive. So there's a lot of examples here because you can use specific and descriptive for a lot of contexts. So we want to describe positive behaviors and explain why they are, why they are important. So um, asking thoughtful questions shows us you're listening to your peers and listening is the secret of awesome communication. So just, you know, being able to say to them that instead of just saying, good job listening, you know, or good job asking questions, really specifically describing that behavior. And this also has a little bit of an outcome to it, right? Listening is the secret of awesome communication. So when you ask thoughtful questions, it shows us you're listening and listening is the secret of awesome communication. That is so descriptive and so specific. That can be really motivating for somebody, you know, to know that, that it's more than just, I answered a question or I, I, I mean, I asked a question. This is what that really meant. That can be much more motivating for somebody. Um, reinforcing the process versus the outcome. So saying that's the right answer, that's good. Knowing the right answer is good, but what's even better is telling students um, or asking students and, and processing with them how they got to that end point. So we know that a lot of students don't like to go through the steps, right, to get to the end. So one thing that we can really do is reward them for going through that process. So by being able to say, how did you get that answer and having them go through that and saying, that is a really great way to come to the right answer. You did this, this, and this, and you got the right answer. So giving them that process information. So again, this is a hot link that you can go back and look at some other examples. Um, and this is also from Edutopia, which is an article that I found, which is really good filled with lots of evidence-based examples. So at the very end, you can also click on that link and go right to that, um, that, example, that um, article. Um, but this is the example that they have here is, Jamal, your classmates were really focused on you as you presented. What do you think you did to grab everyone's attention? So again, asking those kinds of questions of students and having them think about and process that and then being able to go back and say, that was really great how you blah, blah, blah. And I think you're right. I think that's how they were able to really focus on your presentation. That kind of praise um, can really be empowering for students to know that that's what they did, that you observed that, that they recognize that. And you can bet that the next time they do a presentation, they're probably going to keep that in mind. And then another one, and I've mentioned a couple of these earlier, is targeting specific academic behaviors. So looking at um, effort. Some students aren't going to do it the first time. They're not going to be able to get to the end point, but their effort in getting there is just as important as getting to the end product. So that they tried hard, that they persisted, that they tried several times before they asked for help. Those things, effort, can be in very important for students. So praise that. Give, that. give that the power that it deserves. Looking at accuracy. So I see that you went back and checked your work to make sure you got the answer correct. Or, um, you know, even if the answer isn't correct, that they went back and checked it and, and saw that it wasn't correct, but maybe they're now they're working on it. Because we also want to be careful of looking at, you know, only thing that's good is correct answers. Looking at fluency, moving more quickly through things instead of taking a lot of time. Goal setting. So looking at what do you want to accomplish today and meeting those goals. Um, so those are some, some things that you can look at, you know, looking at, um, not just looking at behavior as the way we want to focus our praise, but also looking at all these other academic behaviors that we can look at, because those are going to bridge the gap between um, academics affecting behavior and behavior affecting academics, and those two things being intertwined. So let's, let's use them together to support each other. Um, 
So this is a, a, an example where they gave a praise statement. You wrote nonstop throughout the entire writing period. I appreciate your hard work. So maybe they didn't finish it, but they wrote nonstop. That's effort. I appreciate your hard work. So just some really good ways to kind of think about, um, you know, being really specific and descriptive. Here's some other ones. Um, you did a really nice job staying in your seat and keeping your hands and feet to yourself as opposed to thanks for not disrupting the class today. Again, keeping in mind when we, when we say things to students like you didn't do this, that's a non-behavior. That's not telling them what they did do, it's telling them what they didn't do. And that's not instructional. We have a thing called the dead man's rule. If a dead man can get a, a, a star or a sticker on their chart or get into the treasure box, it means it wasn't a very good behavior. So if a dead man can get into the treasure box, or get a stamp on his card for not disrupting, you know that that's not a good thing. But a dead man would not be able to do a nice job staying in their seat and keeping their hands and feet to themselves, right? You can't sit up in a seat. Uh, keeping hands and feet to yourself is a little bit iffy, but definitely a dead man would not disrupt because a dead man is dead, right? Can't do any disruption. Um, excellent prediction, Farrah. You had to be listening closely to be so detailed in describing what you thought might happen next, as opposed to, again, the generic, nice listening, Farrah. Um, Lamont, I'm impressed with how you went to the glossary to find definitions for new words versus I'm impressed with how you went to the glossary to find definitions. I didn't even know you knew where the glossary was. Right? So that's kind of getting at that, um, uh, kind of bringing up the past or, you know, that little bit of a sarcasm. Hey Jackson, um, this one is a little bit, uh, hey Jackson, come here, I gotta tell you, I'm really impressed with your decision to return to class after the fire drill when others ran off into the hills. <laughs> it takes a lot of self-control and maturity to make these types of responsible choices. Give yourself a pat on the back after you get one from me. As opposed to Jackson, thanks for deciding to come back to class. Luckily for you, you avoided suspension. Could be totally true, but the other one really targets specific skills and decisions that, that Lamont or that Jackson made. So very descriptive, very specific. All right. So these not this list doesn't mean that they're not necessarily true, but they're not going to be behaviors that the students are going to repeat. They're not specific, they're not descriptive. Um, so they're not going to really help us in the end, increasing behavior. All right. So other factors that we want to consider. We want to use positive feedback contingently. So we want to wait until the student actually does the behavior. This is something, again, I'm going to use my puppy as an example, um, that um, my husband will say, Lola, come. And then she starts coming toward him and he starts praising her. And I'm like, she hasn't come to you yet. Don't praise her until she gets to you. Because what you're praising right now is walking towards you. And that's not what you want. So... <coughs> <clears throat> Make sure it's contingent. If she thinks that all she has to do is walk towards you when you say that word, that's what you're going to shape up. So wait until they've actually demonstrated the desired behavior. One of the things that's hard, though, is that with students that have a difficult time even demonstrating that desired behavior, sometimes we have to set the stage for them to do that, right? We have to create opportunities for them to do the behavior or we have to set them up. In dog training terms, we use what's called a lure. So I might lure her to the place I want her to be or to do the thing I want her to do. With our students, we might create antecedents in the environment. So we might um, take some carpenter tape and put it around their seat and say, I need for you to stay in this space and this is how I'm gonna know that you're at your seat. And that little square can help us be able to give them that positive praise and demonstrate that they can engage in that desired behavior. And eventually we might be able to take that away and say, we really want you sitting in your seat, not staying in your seat space. So we might be able to shape that behavior up. But we do want it to be contingent. We want to wait for them to do that behavior and then praise them. We also want it to be as close as, as possible to the behavior and the feedback. Like I said, if we, if we wait, like the student I described that was on the playground, waiting just the three minutes it took him to get into the classroom, he had completely forgotten that whole event. So it, we lost an opportunity to provide some really good social feedback for that student. So try to be as immediate as possible. 
Same thing I will tell you with training a puppy. Um, if she, um, you know, a lot of it is leave it and drop it, right? She's chewing something or playing with something she shouldn't. If I wait too long, it's too late, right? She's already got it and she's running across the house with something in her mouth she shouldn't have. It's too late. So the immediacy can be really important. And then you want to be pretty frequent when you're building the behavior. So there's stages of learning. Acquisition is the first stage of learning, when they're first learning. Now, you may say, well, they should already know how to do this. Possibly and probably, but they don't. So consider it new learning. And you want to provide a lot of positive feedback during initial learning. So give that feedback really frequently. You want to be able to really provide a lot of positive feedback so that they know that this is what you want them to do. Remember that five to one or four to one gets the job done. So if you've been having to do a lot of corrections, either academically or behaviorally or socially, then boost up your positives. Do it more frequently. And then once they start to get it, so for my little Lola, who is asleep here on the floor next to my feet, um, I do, I'm not giving out nearly as many um, food treats because she's learned a lot of her basic um, training behaviors. So she's getting them intermittently now. I'm starting to fade those away. And you need to do the same thing with your students. This is one of the ways that we prevent the externalizing versus internalizing or the intrinsic extrinsic dilemma is that we want now the rewards to become more naturally occurring in the environment. So that as students begin to learn social skills and we've taught them and we rewarded them and we praised them for engaging in these, that now the relationships that they have with students in the classroom and on the playground start to become rewarding in and of itself. So we, can, we only have to give intermittent feedback on specific social skills. So these are some good things to think about when we're thinking about, you know, when, you know, the, the kind of the timing of our feedback. And this will really help us. And I already have already talked about the five to one. Uh, Stephen Ray Flora has a great article on um, the, the ratio and um, using positive feedback um, and, and how important it is for us to keep that up. And there's a, actually, really, there's a lot of research, not just in schools, but in businesses, in marriages, um, across the board about what is an important ratio to have. And there is a ratio that's too high, and that ratio is 11 to 13 to one. That's too much. So we don't wanna do too much praise, but we don't wanna do too little praise either. Okay. Um, here's also another really important factor. Reward the behavior, not the person. So we want to make sure that we're focused on the behavior because the behavior is what we want to change, right? The behavior is what we want them to do more of. We don't want to focus on the attributes of the person. So a good example is you are working hard on task, quiet during independent seat work. That's respectful of others to get their work done. Nice job. As opposed to you were selected as student of the week. Congratulations. That's focusing on them as student of the week, as opposed to looking at the attributes of the behavior that may have gotten them student of the week. Um, when you walk in the halls, that keeps yourself and everyone safe. Way to go. Versus the, I like it when you. So the, I like it when you statements really puts the reward statement or the motivation statement on the, t on the person who's giving it. So students begin to say, I want to engage in certain behaviors because it'll make the adults happy. And what we want is the students to change their behavior because it's the right thing to do, right? So if they're only engaging in behavior because the adults want them to do it, guess when they'll engage in behavior? Only when the adults are around, right? Or when the right adult. How many of you have heard, you're not my teacher? All right, that might be a component of that piece, which is, I've learned that there's certain people who like it when I, but I haven't heard that from you, or I don't know who you are, so I don't have that relationship with you. So, and we are all human, so we do want to please adults, but we want to try to focus more on their behavior as opposed to, I want you to do it because I like you to do it. So you want to keep that a little bit in balance. Um, Sally, excellent job lining up quickly and quietly. Now we can get to music on time as opposed to the generic excellent job, Sally. So focusing on the behaviors again and not just you did a great job, Sally. Um, 
Sally, you've got a 96% on your spelling test. Great improvement. Tell me how you studied, your work paid off, as opposed to Sally, keep working hard. Or even saying, Sally, you are, a, you are a spelling wizard. That's really focusing in on the student. And then the last one here, student super job finishing the assignment by yourself, working independently will help you be successful in your other classes. And then I like it when you work by yourself and get your work done by yourself. So again, focusing on the student or the I like it, which is me. This, you did that because I like it and it works for me. So keeping in mind that we want to increase behavior and so we want our praise statements to be focused on student behavior and, um, and, and giving the students the message of here's the behaviors that you did that are praiseworthy. Keeping my eye on the time. So we'd already talked this about this a little bit earlier, praise effort, but don't praise perfection. So I talked about effort a little bit, but we also wanna be careful about the other end of this, which is perfection. So I'm sure many of you have worked with students who are really focused on getting it right. They'll erase holes in their paper because it's not exactly the way they want it. They won't do something unless they are 100% confident that they can get it right. So a lot of students build up a lot of anxiety and angst because they don't feel confident about their abilities. And sometimes we inadvertently reinforce some of those things. Um, you know, by saying things, you got all check pluses on your homework. You worked um, in your group without once causing a problem. James, 100%, the only one in the class, great job. So we inadvertently reinforce some of these perfection ideas. Um, we may focus on scores and grades that matter more than learning does. So as opposed to tell me what you learned, it is what did you get for a grade? Like how many kids do that, right? What'd you get? What'd you get? As opposed to what did you learn? So some of these things we want to start thinking about, you know, um, what did you learn? Um, how much effort did you put in? And, and, um, that, and praising kids for putting more and more effort in as opposed to the, um, the grade you got or, the, or, or being perfect or having this exactly the way um, you had it in your mind. That's the right brain, left brain thing being kind of cruel to us. So just keep in mind those kinds of things um that's for some students especially ones who have learning deficits if they feel like they can't be perfect they will put up behavioral um defenses to um resist that so um and that can destroy their motivation inadvertently the other is assigning labels which kind of goes along with that is using you know you know you are a star speller you're a super swimmer you're a great helper um, and this is assigning labels to them as opposed to, again, looking at the attributes. And we want to try to reduce um, that so we don't, um, if, you, if you give somebody the impression that they're already great and perfect at something, they may reduce their motivation to continue to grow in certain areas. So if I already think that I am an awesome um, painter, why would I continue to try to excel in painting? Because I already believe, well, I've already been told I'm an awesome painter. So um, one of the things that people always say to me is you're an expert in behavior. I'm like, yeah, I still have a lot to learn. I don't ever want to think I'm an expert because that means I have to, I can stop learning and I'm always learning. So I'm always trying to remind myself that I'm not an expert in anything. Um, I really need to keep learning and growing every single day. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier too, but this is just getting real specific. Avoid praise that hints at past problems. Um, Monique, good to see you arrive on time for once. And I've, I've heard people use these kind of in a joking way, but we, we're never sure how the students are hearing this or accepting this, especially students who are on the spectrum who don't understand this kind. Um, I suppose in some cases people can say, I have a relationship with this person and I can do this, but we don't really know how students take this, um, you know, wow, I'm shocked, flabbergast, flabbergast, I never thought you'd pass that exam. Um, you know, well, took you forever, but you finally got the steps in the right order. I mean, these are things, I'm sure you've heard these kinds of things. Um, and it, you know, I think a lot of times people say them because they're, they're saying them to be, to praise them, but they're also saying them like in a joking way, but 
in a way it's sort of a little backwards jab at the same time. So we want to be careful of that, especially knowing the, who the audience is and whether students actually accept that the way it's intended, understand it as it's intended, um, and whether it really does have the desired effect, which is helps students grow and become stronger, what we want them to become stronger at. Um, so there's some other preferred behaviors too that we want to think about in ourselves. Again, we talked about proximity, getting pretty close to students when we do this. Listening, so really listening to students, providing eye contact, looking at them when we give these praise statements, um, giving them our full attention in other words. So if we're listening and making eye contact, we're giving them our full attention, using a pleasant voice, smiling. Um, touch, and I know that that, you know, you, you put that, you put that on there, people are like, oh, you know, watch out, but, you know, a brief nurturing touch, so you can touch somebody safely between the elbow and the shoulder. Now we don't even have to worry about it because we can't do anything through our computers, but, um, you know, touching somebody on the shoulder to get their attention or giving somebody a high five or a fist bump, those kinds of things can be safe way to um, provide some um, connection. And then um, using the student's name. So if you don't know the somebody's name, asking their name and making that personal connection. Um, having a puppy and, you know, work, walking her through my neighborhood, I'm learning all of my neighbors now and all their names. And it's, it's been a great relationship building process in my own neighborhood because I've got this puppy and this is, she's my conduit to being able to do this. And it's really awesome. You know, it's such a great way to change my behavior in relationship to my, to my neighbors. I feel so much closer to all of them, just that part. All right, so how do we construct these praise statements? So we want to first specifically describe the behavior. So explicitly define what you've done and you want to continue. It's like a videotape replay expressed in words of classroom or school-wide expectations. So when the bell rang to line up after recess, you stopped playing and walked directly to your class line and waited for directions. So that, that is like a pretty descriptive like I said, videotape replay of what you saw. A student would, would be hard pressed to not know exactly what they did and be able to do that thing again if you were that explicit. So this is really a good way to describe behavior. So explicitly describe what you saw, pretty much a videotape replay, and use the words of your classroom or your school-wide expectations. So if you're using words like safe, respectful, responsible, if you're using words like um, um, co cooperation or, um, or kindness, include those into that. The next one is, is to provide some type of rationale. So explain the reason why the behavior is important. Teach the benefits of the behavior and the impact it has on others. And again, use the classroom expectations that they might um, a lot that might connect to it. So when you use a zero or a one level voice in the halls, it allows others to teach and learn. Um, and so this is, gives the student a rationale as to why they would wanna engage in that behavior. So you were using a voice level one or zero, that allowed others to, that allowed teachers to teach and students to learn. Thanks for doing that. So this is another really good way to provide good praise, okay? Another one is to provide a positive consequence. So this positive feedback alone could be sufficiently reinforcing, but if you want to provide some type of consequence along with that, that can make it even better. So I've seen you two days in a row holding the door for others. You've earned a panda paw or here's a high five or here's an elbow bump or when we get back to the classroom, you get to pass out the papers, anything like that. So um, finding a way to provide some type of, um, I like social reinforcers best, but tangible things are also fine. Um, if, if you're gonna use tangible rewards, I prefer them to be school tools, like pencils and erasers and <coughs> sticky notes and things like that that students can use at school. That's just my personal preference. That's not, some, that's not research based at all. I just feel like um, if we're gonna provide tangible rewards, it'd be really good if they help students be better students. That's my personal preference. So total disclaimer there on that. Um, the next one is about being sincere and appropriate. Use a warm, 
genuine, sincere uh, voice and approach. Um, use a variety of phrases showing spontaneity and credibility and find your own style to communicate. I don't know why the font got smaller there. It's not your eyes, it really is smaller. So super job walking quietly in your group that shows respect to everyone, thank you, or wow, what a great job of accepting a correction. You looked right at me and said, okay, you didn't argue or complain. When you do that, you show respect and you learn and avoid mistakes in the future. And then this one also provides a consequence. Why don't you um, be the first one to leave class today? So, you know, these kinds of things really show that connection, um, being sincere and being connected to the student can really, um, again, make that, that praise much more uh, connected. So you can put these all together in one statement as well if you want to be really excessive. Um, when the bell rang to line up after recess, you stopped playing and walked directly to your class and waited for directions. Lining up right away shows you know and follow procedures. Because you were so responsible, you've earned a panda paw. So that put all of those component pieces into one, piece, one to, into one praise statement. Or thank you for being respectful of others by using a voice level zero or one in the halls during class. This allows teachers to teach and your peers to learn. You earned a tiger stripe raffle ticket toward your homework pass. So you can, you can use those component pieces in and of themselves, or you can put them all together to make a really powerful, effective praise statement. Um, so in summary, we want to try to avoid giving labels. You want to use descriptive praise. So you want to describe those actions, uh, avoid using vague or nebulous variations, um, identify that specific action that you want to praise, keep the praise in the present. If you're going to talk about what happened in the, pa <clears throat> in the past, make sure they're positive things, not, you know, you never were able to do that before. Praise effort. I think effort Again, with many of our learners who struggle, effort might be the best that we can get from them. So let's give them some credit for it. Say praise in a tone of voice that conveys sincere appreciation. Reward behavior, not the person. Make the praise as instructional as possible. Um, describe the behavior, the rationale, and the consequence. So if we can make it instructional, if we can actually teach while we're providing praise, wow, that would be awesome, right? That was a vague statement right there, but still would be awesome. And reach for our five to one ratio. Let's try to create a culture of positivity where we're providing more positive feedback. And that feedback, you know, when, when we say five to one, it doesn't have to be this type of, this type of a praise statement. It means having a conversation with your students that is building a relationship. It means commenting that um, you're glad to see them today. It just means five positive interactions. It doesn't have to be this, this instructional praise statement. Five to one simply means have five positive interactions for every one time you have to correct a student. But when you want to really get to the point where you want to have an effective praise statement, think about the things that we've talked about today to make it count when you want to really change behavior for students. All right, so at the very end of this slide, you'll see this. There is the, um, uh, the URL, or you can use your Q, whatever it is, thing, reader, um, and that will take you right to a Google form where you answer some questions, and then um, you click on a link, and it uh, automatically generates your certificate of participation. And once again, I thank you very, very much. I'm sorry that we didn't have much time for um, questions and participation. Put, you want me to put the URL in the chat box? Tracy, are you doing that? Let's see. Oh, Tracy's put the recording. I, I can um, put the URL in there too. Okay, all right. And the PowerPoint, Tracy, you have the PowerPoint, except it, um, I can send you this latest version that's got this last slide in it. So I need to just send Tracy this last version because it didn't have this last slide. So I'll send that to Tracy. And are you able to post the PowerPoint to Tracy? Tracy, can you hear me? 
I can. Yes, oh. I can. I can post it. Um, I'll have to double check um, where we've posted them. I think you can post this, the slides there as well. Um, and if you send me the, the last set, I will um, save it as a PDF and we'll put it up there if right, it's okay great. with that. I want to thank everybody again for coming today. I really appreciate your time and your comments. It's really awesome. And um, so that's, that's a sincere praise statement from me, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Gail. So me too. We're working on it. Tracy is our is our DOE cooperative learning. Um, I mean, cooperative agreement person. So we are working on it. Thanks, everybody. Have thank a great you. rest of your day. Everybody, go out and take a walk. It's so awesome outside. Pat, thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. Everybody, have a great afternoon. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Sarah. <laughs>